Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the regular city council meeting of the San Rosa City Council on August 14th, 2018. Uh, Ms. Gomez, would you announce the roll, please? Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Sawyer. Thank you. We had no closed session, no study session. Uh, we go on to proclamations and presentations and we will start with uh, Miss Sonoma County 2018 and Mr. Olivares, you have this. Thank you, Mayor. And it really is uh, an honor to be uh, presenting this proclamation to Tyler. I think I first met Tyler when she was what, maybe six years old or so, maybe? Five years old, okay, yes. Uh, whereas lifetime Sonoma County resident Tyler Avery Lewis is recognized for achieving the title of 2018 Miss Sonoma County and being only the 70, 72nd young woman to hold the distinguished title of Miss Sonoma County. And whereas at 22 years of age, Tyler Avery Lewis has already proven herself to be an incredible young lady while studying full-time at San Jose Junior College and thus previously serving as captain of her high school varsity cheer team, helping institute a program to teach children at no charge, serving as president of her dance club, and serving as vice president uh, uh, of her black student union chapter. And whereas, as Miss Sonoma County, Tyler Avery Lewis has become a source of inspiration for people of all ages for not only her remarkable accomplishments, but for also being very open uh, in engaging and discussing in discussions surrounding the inclusion of additional and more accurate African American literature in Sonoma County schools, and partnering with community activists and leader of Lucien Herman J. Hernandez in promoting the inclusion of Sonoma County minorities in community based engagement and conversation. And whereas, as Miss Sonoma County, Tyler Avery Lewis will be representing our city of Santa Rosa and the county of Sonoma at numerous local gatherings and events during her year of service and was a competitor for the coveted title of Miss California this past June. And now, therefore, be it resolved that Chris Corsi, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, congratulates and extends praise to 2018 Mr. McCounty, Tyler A. Ray Lewis. Tyler, if, uh, if you want to make some comments, there's a microphone right behind you there. Um, maybe, maybe you can sit at the, sit at the table. My, oh, Stephanie will hold it up for you, I think, maybe, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yes. There we go. Oh, yes. We'll make it work. Uh, first of all, it's a privilege and an honor to be before you and all of you who are behind me, but not so much behind me. Um, as mostly as Tyler Avery, I never thought I would have this opportunity. And as Miss Sonoma County, it is such an amazing, an amazing feet to be the third African-American to hold this title. And I thank you, Mr. Olivares, for watching me grow from the five-year-old into the 22-year-old that I am. And along this journey, I've made so many friends and so many amazing um, men and women who I didn't know. And I have this opportunity now as Miss Sonoma County to thank you all who are on this council. And I thank you, Mayor Corsi, and I thank you, Vice Mayor Rogers and Council Member Combs and Council Member, Sw excuse me, I'm going to pronounce your name. Wrong Schwell home, and especially thank you, Councilmember Tibbetts, for taking the time to honor me in such a way because I do not deserve this. And I would like to say that in front of everybody, I don't deserve this. There's so many other people who along the way have helped me be who I am today, um, especially Mr. Giraldi. And it is so amazing. Um, to be Miss Sonoma County, and I don't think a lot of people understand the importance of holding this title and what it represents to young women and young people, especially because I see it as a beauty contest. And it's not a beauty contest, it's a scholarship competition. It's a competition to be educated and to show who you are internally rather than externally. And having this privilege and honor and being able to do what I do and being the face of our community as an African American in times like these is such an amazing, an amazing um, feeling. And I'd like to say that, excuse me, coming out of the fair and having fun moments like that, but yet going on Facebook and seeing that there are African Americans who lose their lives on a day to day basis, it just it gives me strength to know that I can be a voice for my people. 
when there isn't a voice, my voice will be heard. So thank you yet again. And it's gonna be an amazing next eight months and I hope not to let you all down. So thank you. Thank you, Tyler. I have a card on this item, Mr. Cherneff. How could I not? So Tyler Avery Lewis, unto American spirit be truest. Fabulous, absolutely singing the American, America the beautiful, uh, spiritual romance and fulfilled by dance unto almighty dutiful. Here in Luther Burbank, home and gardens filled with overabundance and bounty, a shining star sure to go far, currently Miss Sonoma County. She be of the generation spoken so long ago who will do greater things than I, changing this old status quo. And when the boss was on the cross, the men ran away, spiritually lost. Remember who stayed, women of courage and conviction. Time's upon us for freedom's insurrection. For the goddess be pregnant with purpose. And as surely as these words be spoken, her water is already broken. Birthing the phoenix of fire arisen, fulfilling the promised desire, busting all chains of this prison. After all, as I always say, women are smarter than men, and that's wisdom far deeper than Zen. And I am Peter King of Masterpiece Theater. So, uh, Tyler, you need to rise up and be the leader. Because you women students in California are the most powerful uh, of all the planet. So I invite you to look deep and focus on how to be standing on granite. For our high noon be this full moon. To assert your true power, I say, Rosebud, Rosebud, come now to flower. And be fulfilling your fate as destiny's date, for indeed you surely be a princess Jedi that truly does rate. All right, moving on to our second proclamation for Climbers for Peace, and Mr. Rogers has this one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so we have three recipients, Fred Petuccia, uh, Xavier Polk and David Wallstrom. If you uh, would come forward, at least the, the two of you that I see here. Whereas Climbers for Peace was founded 21 years ago and is sponsored jointly by sister cities Santa Rosa, Chircarsi, and Veterans for Peace, and whereas CFP has been bringing ordinary citizens from different countries together for climbing adventures that demonstrate how people with different languages and cultures can cooperate in a spirit of trust and friendship, and whereas CFP has had 10 prior expeditions in Europe and America summiting iconic mountains, including including in Russia, the highest mountains in Europe, Olympus, and the home of the gods in Greece, Shasta in California, and Denali in Alaska, and whereas a group of veterans and other citizens joined with members of the Iranian Mountaineering Federation for a peace climb to the summit of Damavand, an 18,605-foot volcano that is sacred to the Persian people, and whereas Fred Petuccia of Santa Rosa at age 75 became the oldest American to ever summit, and whereas pictures of the climbers proudly holding Iranian and American flags on the summit were sent around the world and provided inspiration and hope for peace-loving people everywhere. And whereas CFP hopes to reduce tensions between America and Iran and help avoid another tragic war in the Middle East. Now therefore, be it resolved that Chris Corsi, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, commend Xavier Polk, Fred Petuccia, and David Wallstrom of Climbers for Peace in Iran for the vision and courage they demonstrated by reaching out to the Iranian people at this time of increased governmental tensions between our two countries, thereby promoting world peace for all people. Americans. 
entire uh, country. And there's only, last year, there were only 100 Americans visit the country in the whole, uh, the whole year. So uh, we saw and received w amazingly warm, gracious uh, welcome from everyone we met. And I would have to say it was one of the safest countries I've ever felt in. There was no graffiti, there was no trash, no litter. And fortunately, the Iranian people make a difference, a differentiation between ordinary citizens like ourselves and our government policies. So that was truly wonderful. I um, was pleasantly surprised that I was able to make the summit, got altitude sickness at around 16,000, but managed to push on through it. And um, one of our other climbers that uh, is one of my personal heroes, could not be here today, uh, Xavier Polk, as a PhD psychologist, they give only the toughest cases to him. And he's treating someone in the East Bay today. Uh, and he's a fantastic distance runner, runs about four marathons a year, and he's legally blind. So I always have immense respect for someone that has a major handicap and overcomes that. So he was a great climbing companion. And I'd like to have my other companion here, um, Dave, say a few oh, words. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you for having us. I have a few notes because I'm not a very good extemporaneous uh, speaker. Um, affiliated with Climbers for Peace, uh, Fred is a member of Veterans for Peace. I have a history of protesting our wars, going back to Vietnam, marching in the streets to shut down the Oakland Induction Center, marching in San Francisco during the Iraq War. I certainly hope that with the reimposition of sanctions, that we do not have another war in the Mideast. And with that in mind, um, that was in my mind the whole time in, uh, in Iran. So it's uh, wonderful now to be joined with Fred and Veterans for Peace in a common cause of uh, pursuing peace. And uh, I, I never would have seen this. 50 years ago, and just as uh, we have common cause in, uh, in Iran, there was a, a lot of acknowledgement that we are all one people, um, our governments, our governments aren't, uh, aren't the best, There's, uh, we can take issue with both governments very easily, but people would often say, uh, we're all one, only the governments are in the way. And um, many times, uh, I never heard a single negative word about the United States in Iran. The people were incredibly warm, hospitable, welcoming. And uh, sometimes um, they would go, make a gesture with fingers, link fingers like that. And they go, US, Iran, one. Um, so, this was a wonderful experience. The people of uh, Iran, I, I hope that we don't uh, uh, get into a conflict with them. They're uh, warm, welcoming, and um, I hope that uh, other folks have a chance to uh, visit this uh, wonderful country. Thank you. I would like to present to each of the council members a uh, pin that we gave out, probably uh, 50, 60 of them to people we met from Veterans for Peace, and also a statement of purpose, which included in our purpose is to refrain our government from interfering covertly or overtly in the internal affairs of other nations. And sadly, we've been interfering with many nations around the world, including Iran, for way too long. And then, only because he's so good looking, I, I have a, a shirt for uh, Mayor Chris Corsi. I'll make sure he gets it, Fred. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Because I'm good looking? Is that really? Congratulations to you both. Uh, very well done. And we have 
Yes, thank you for the pictures also. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cherneff. Thank you, Mayor. I always try and make it a point to say thank you to all veterans and and also uh, all law enforcement, for they've all taken a, an oath to the U.S. Constitution. And under the Constitution, there's only four things you can do wrong. Harm someone, kill someone, break something, or steal someone. But the bar lawyers that are running this country uh, have turned it into neighborhoods full of codes and rules and regulations. So warriors David, Xavier, and Fred, Americans who most recently led a uniting climb described here in rhyme to restrain an assault of Iran, primarily for they rejected the Fed. Yes, indeed, in addressing greed, how many lives given, how many dead? These usurious bankers and their lawyerly minions maintain the war effort, being fact, hardly opinion. These bankers in the bar, so too all religious deception, calls for true unity by prophecy, delivering freedom strike reception. As California goes, so does the world. Time to be fulfilled by prophecy with the red, white, and blue unfurled. The 40-day freedom strike frees the U.S. Constitution. For the world has forever, for the world has forever from your heart sought to heist the power, authority, and the light of Christ. I am Peter, I am the seer, and the living spirit of the Constitution has been waiting in the prison cell of Brother Leonard Peltier, who represents the 500-year indigenous resistance worldwide. It's time to watch the bad guys all collide. Being hell-bent and heaven-sent, we now together withdraw our consent from the very system that maintains its corruption. A 40-day strike be the royal interruption. Fulfilling your mission with the cosmic physician is time to requisition the power of Christ to make real the promise of America. And so the veterans of peace, I say unto this prophecy from on high obey. Thank you for all your wonderful work. Moving on to 7.1, Mr. McGlynn. There is no report to on 7.1. Any report from the city manager tonight? Yes. Um, uh, from, this, from the water utility, the city of Santa Rosa has been selected as the 2018 Silver Beacon Award winner presented by the Institute for Local Government. The city will be receiving the award based on the following achievements. 21% community greenhouse gas reductions, 8% agency greenhouse gas reductions, 8% energy savings, 5% natural gas savings, and platinum level award in sustainability best practices. The the award will be presented at the League of California's annual conference in Long Beach on September 13th, and the mayor and the director Hornstein will be at the awards ceremony. Thank you. Any report from the city attorney's office tonight? No, I have no reports tonight. Thank you. Statements of abstention from council members? Nothing tonight. And mayors and council members reports. Who wants to start? Anyone? Mr. Schwedhelm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, item 10.1.8, the Groundwater Sustainability Agency. We had a meeting <clears throat> last week, and I just want to report out on five action items. We extend the contract for the rate and fee study. Again, that, that came to this council uh, several months ago. Uh, we've amended the contract with Raft Raftelis, added another $50,000 to their budget with the basin re, um, prioritization and some other movements there. Uh, that study needs to expand its scope. We also authorized a three-year contract for an annual audit with uh, Vicente and Brinker, a local firm, not to exceed 13650 bucks. Then also the selection for a GSA administrator, uh, the RFP for that position was issued July 19th and it closed yesterday. Uh, staff will be reviewing the written proposals and then we'll 
conducting interviews the week of September 24th. Um, I will be on that interview panel, which will be making a recommendation for the entire to the entire board for the new GSA administrator. They also author, authorized the plan managers to submit or support a request for a basin boundary modification to include a portion of the Wilson Grove Highlands into the Santa Rosa Plain Basin. That's somewhat complicated and technical issue with that new basin um, may be able to split into both uh, Marine County and Petaluma Basin in addition to the uh, Santa Rosa Plain Basin. So we'll be supporting the efforts to uh, go in that direction. And then lastly, we authorize the advisory committee to have the ability to have designated alternates. For instance, all of us electeds have alternates, but then our advisory committee, there was no process if they couldn't make a meeting to have their alternate uh, appear. So we allowed them to create that process so that they were able to, uh, their interests would be able, able to be heard. And that's it for the GSA. And then I'm guessing you'll report out on the two ad hoc meetings we had last week too. If you want to, go ahead. Oh, but you're the chair. I'm sure you would. Uh, so on the um, August 8th, the uh, Joint City County Homeless System Redesign Ad Hoc Committee, of which Mayor Corsi, Council Member Combs, and I are uh, members, met with the Continuing of Care Board uh, to discuss the uh, redesign of the system. I think we made an actual lot of progress, and I really appreciated the uh, facilitator after we had the discussion. Everyone had the opportunity to say, uh, how comfortable are you with the decisions that are going forward? Forward. And I think without exception, everyone had a green card, which means they could live with it. There were one or two yellow cards with some trepidation, but I think that's a, uh, a lot of progress from where we were weeks and months ago to where we are now. So very impressed with the progress. And in the joint city uh, county build rebuild meeting, um, I'm sure Vice Mayor Rogers will want to report out on the community celebration, but we had that again last week and have another one on Thursday. Great. And the next meeting of the... Um the homeless ad hoc between the city and the county is on Thursday at noon. Um, anyone else? Ms. Combs. I just have uh, actually a couple of questions for the city manager or, or um, I was hoping that we would have a report out on um, the activities on Apollo Way um, and that area with regard to the um, RVs that are there. I had a call today from a gentleman who is on South Dutton near Storage Master, and he has expressed concern of an increase in number of persons with RVs in his area. Um, so it concerns me if we're moving people from one area, if they are relocating to another area. Um, I obviously am one of those people that thinks it's time for us to have a safe parking program on city property, but I am awaiting my colleagues' approvals on that one. Um, it, it doesn't feel comfortable to me to keep just moving people around. Um, that, that was kind of the, the primary concern I have. Is there anything to report on um, the activity there? I'm getting mixed messages about what's going on so I'm happy to have council up to the staff update council tomorrow on on the ongoing activities. The last report outs reflect where we're sitting, but I will I will make sure staff gets a, a more current update out. That that would be really helpful. I'm also um, looking on the um, list the future agendas items um, for the. Um, rental inspection program and the non-discrimination for voucher ordinances program that we recently budgeted. Um, so I, it, when that's available to have on the, on the list of future items, it would be helpful so that I can let folks who are asking me about those know when those are coming up. Thank you. And, and just on that, um, it was my understanding from our conversation last week that uh, the staff in housing and community development is is uh, working diligently now on the uh, community development block grant disaster recovery um, action plan that needs to be 120 days we have from today to get that done that's the priority at this point and then we'll uh, when that capacity is available 
the rental inspection program is next in line. Is that correct, Mr. McGlynn? We're currently reviewing that, but you know, we, we really do need to move on the DR front. Um, as, as I communicated to council earlier today, um, there has been movement on the federal side. I suspect that that'll mean that a, a delegation of both city and county electeds need to um, uh, go to Sacramento and get a better sense of what H. CD's action plan, and that's housing community development on the state side, is going to do. Um, now we, as you as you know, we have uh, Haggerty Consulting, um, which we will be working with to develop that action plan, but it is an accurate assessment that um, we're facing a, a, a very uh, tight timetable to get an action plan together. Thank you. Thank you. I, I did understand that we have a lot to do. Uh, and I'm just looking for seeing it appear on the agenda list for future months or pending. Any other council members reports? Just uh, um, actually, Mr. Um, Rogers, are you? I'll let it go. Um, I want to report on a, a event held here in the chamber last Friday. Um, we have a, a bust up in the, actually have two busts in the corners up there. One is Luther Burbank, most people in Santa Rosa know who he is. The other is Kanaye Nagasawa. And um, he uh, was a Japanese citizen who came to the United States in about eight, nine, 1870 and uh, moved up into the hills at Fountain Grove and started growing grapes and making wine uh, like so many other immigrants have done in this county. Um, he um, had the round barn built, the landmark that was built or that was burned uh, last October 9th. Uh, and he, he brought a lot of attention to the, um, the wine industry in Sonoma County in California. Last week, members of a delegation from his hometown of Kago, Kagoshima, Japan, visited here. Uh, the mayor of Kagoshima, Hiroyuki Mori, uh, he and I exchanged some gifts. Um, Mr. McGlynn and I got some fancy um, sake drinking outfits to, uh, to, to wear when we're enjoying the, uh, the fruit of the vine in, in Japan. Um, we should have we should have worn them tonight, and there were also about a dozen Japanese exchange students who are here for a couple of weeks, and that exchange has been going on for quite a while between Santa Rosa and Kagoshima in alternate summers, where uh, Santa Rosa kids go there and, and Kagoshima kids come here. It was a really nice event. Uh, they also the friends of Kagoshima here in Santa Rosa and and people in Kagoshima, Japan have raised more than $75,000 for, for um, fire relief and recovery for Santa Rosa as well. So um, was really happy to welcome those folks. Moving on to item 11, approval of minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of May 15th and May 16th? We'll show those approved as submitted. And Mr. McGlynn, consent. Item 12.1, motion contract award pavement preventive maintenance 2018. Item 12.2, resolution approve grant of easement to Pacific Gas and Electric Company on city owned property located at 781 Farmers Lane, Santa Rosa, APN 014-161-029 to facilitate the Farmers Lane well facility rehabilitation project and authorize the director of water department to execute necessary documents. Item 12.3, resolution, approve modification of an existing easement with Pacific Gas and Electric Company on city owned property location at 2260 Sonoma Avenue, Santa Rosa and authorize the director of the water department to execute necessary documents. Item 12.4, resolution, first amendment to the 
the revocable long-term parking permit with the United States Postal Service. Item 12.5, resolution, approval of design build method of procurement for parking access and revenue control system. Item 12.6, resolution, GSA extension, First Amendment to General Services Agreement F001349, Universal Site Services Incorporated. Item 12.7, resolution, approving a third amendment to the Professional Services Agreement, Safety Employees, Police and Fire for Wellness Services with Wellness Solutions Incorporated. Item 12.8, Resolution, Third Amendment to Professional Services Agreement with Wellness Solutions Incorporated for Miscellaneous Employees. Thank you, Council, any questions? Yes, Ms. Combs. Uh, I had had two questions, I had a question on two of the items, 12.2 and 12.3, um, with regard to whether for the easements for PG&E we were requiring undergrounding. I heard back about one of them. I did not hear or I may have missed hearing about the other one. Uh, do we have that information and is it our intention to require undergrounding in the future as we do easements with PG&E? Good afternoon, Jill Scott, right away agent. Sorry. Uh, on item 12.2, um, that one is supposed to be undergrounded. That is the, um, wait, I'm trying to see which one it is, sorry. Yes, that is supposed to be undergrounded. It's in the design for it. And on 12.3 as well, um, that there may be one item that's a little bit um, above ground for the switches. Um, in the future on the downtown projects, we have been asking um, pg e to underground their items. I'm having some luck with that. It is more expensive. Right, is, is it possible for us to create a general policy that unless there's some mitigating reason, we would ask them to underground? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will move items 12.1 through 12.8 of the consent calendar and waive further reading of the text. Second. Your votes, Council. It passes with six ayes. Still being before five o'clock, we will move on to item 14.1. Mr. McGlynn. Item 14.1, report hazard mitigation grant program project application submittals. Jason Nutt, Director of Transportation and Public Works, leading the presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor Corsi and Council Members. I'm Jason Nutt, I'm the Director of Transportation and Public Works. Uh, I am uh, the front guy today talking about the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Um, in the audience are representatives from just about every one of the departments that has a grant uh, incorporated or a grant application that they're requesting. And so if as we get through the process or to the end of the process, you have detailed questions that I can't answer about them, uh, I'll be inviting someone to come down and provide a more detailed level of response. So the goal of this is to apply for Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. This is a FEMA-funded uh, project or a FEMA-funded uh, uh, program that is identified following the proclamation of a federal disaster. And the, it's really, these are, these are, this is a program that's specifically identified for um, providing benefits to uh, improving loss of life, um, looking at uh, lessening the impact of a specific disaster, uh, trying to mitigate consequences of different types of disasters that can come to an effect in organ a community. And it's uh, administered through the office of, or the California Office of Emergency Services. Um, it is, uh, Sorry, get up. Excuse me for a second. 
So when a disaster is declared, it doesn't matter where the disaster in California, if it's presidential disaster, uh, any entity within the state can submit an application to receive funds to improve the situation for a community. And in this particular case, uh, we have two possible opportunities. Uh, they relate to the fires in Northern California and Southern California. Um, and. Uh, that's what we're that's what we're looking to do today um, we went through an initial evaluation period uh, back in the beginning of the calendar year where staff from different departments identified over 30 projects. Uh, those projects ranged um, all over the board in different types of mitigation methods that we may want to implement uh, through the course of um, through the course of this process to mitigate different types of disasters. Uh, and, and, I, and I would I would like to add for council that what this works off of because of the condensed time frames associated with it is your already existing mitigation plans. So the expectation is your mitigation plan has been developed to a point that you can capitalize on these grant opportunities. So it's not stuff that hasn't been already vetted through some process. There's some, there's some stragglers in that conversation, but mostly this is meant to capitalize on your existing mitigation plans that you've adopted. Yeah, so the, our, local, our agency has developed a local hazard mitigation plan. Um, we did utilize that as a base document to identify the initial project scopes. Uh, we did expand on that because of the nature of the disasters that came forward and the type of uh, evaluation process that we went through. Um, ultimately, what happened is um, we vetted a series of, pro, uh, of projects. We worked with our consultant, uh, Ernst & Young. We took the 30 projects that uh, the staff had come up with. We bounced these ideas off of state representatives. Ultimately, what came back uh, was nine projects, um, made it through the initial screening. Uh, we have notice of intents that we've developed for those, and those have all been approved. Uh, those nine projects um, are broken up into uh, three projects that uh, the utilities uh, and Santa Rosa Water have prepared. Uh, those have been taken to the Board of Public Utilities on the 2nd and were approved to move forward. Um, there are six projects that are general fund in nature and that's really what we're here to discuss today are the general fund projects. Um, I do have representatives from Water here that can answer questions more detailed about the three that they've, uh, that they've put forward if you have those questions. Um, of those six projects, we did already submit two applications. Um, we have the opportunity if council does not approve those applications to pull them back. The reason we did that, each of the releases of funds for hazard mitigation grant programs, there's dedicated pots of money for each of those. And rather than putting all of our projects into one release where they're all competing against each other, we did our best to try to separate projects that were ready for the July release. And we went ahead and pushed those forward um, for consideration. Um, that does not supersede your authority to tell us otherwise, but we did that on behalf of the organization trying to maximize the benefit that we could receive through the two different releases. The second release is the September 4th, and that's the one that's coming up. That's what our intent is, is to try to get uh, your feedback and approvals, and then we submit the remaining items uh, or the remaining projects for, for that release. Uh, here are the nine projects that we're looking at. I'm gonna do my best to try to give you a very brief update on or a description of those projects. Project 275 is the public safety battery backup or public safety backup generator. Um, we determined during the facilities assessment and and as a, a function of this and other events that the backup generator is not properly functioning. Uh, we have made attempts to work around it with some portable generators in order to make this work. Uh, and but we did determine that that repairing this and making a permanent uh, improvement is something. That that's important. We would like to not MacGyver our situation through that first one. Uh, we did find that when we MacGyvered it the first time, um, 
Well, we had some difficulties with some of the lights that sort of blew up because we put too much energy into the system. Um, and that was uh, that was something that we're, we were, you know, we're, we're trying to look at the age of the building. We're trying to look at the facility, what it should be accepting, what it can. And, and so this is one of the challenges that we ran into is the pieces weren't connecting up properly. So we would like, and that's what this application is for, is to do a proper reconstruction uh, and put in a piece of equipment that's, that's appropriate for that facility. Uh, project um, 167 is uh, backup generators for water and wastewater facilities. Um, this project will replace three existing substandard diesel generators and 19 existing propane or natural gas emergency generators with more reliable diesel generators at the 22 critical wastewater facilities. Um, what they ended up finding out is during this particular disaster it was extremely difficult to get propane up to these locations. Uh, diesel is much more readily available. It's, uh, it's an easier product to work with. And um, that's exact, That's why uh, Santa Rosa Water is looking at converting these from uh, into something that's a little easier for them to manage uh, in disasters. Are these primarily pump stations? These are water and sewer lift stations. Lift stations. Uh, there is, it does also include the um, sub-regional system leading to the geysers. Those are also a part of this program as well. Just to make sure I didn't misstate. Well, he's not getting up that fast, so I'll move on. <laughs> Um, projects 286 uh, are dam inundation flood maps. Um, we we own a series of dams in this city, and this and in particular, the Recreation and Parks Department is the responsible entity for that. Um, those dam inundation maps are are related to technical studies that are done to determine whether poor maintenance or failure uh, from a natural disaster would result in inundation into low lying areas immediately adjacent, and what the resulting damage uh, is associated with. With that and uh, we haven't the current maps that we have are dated 1970 uh, those maps need to be updated in order to comply with state uh, state standards that went into effect uh, July 1st 2017 and so this is an area that we've been we've been looking at for the last year trying to figure out how we were going to accomplish this um, with the hazard mitigation grant program it seemed like an appropriate fit for that specific request uh, project 196 is the seismic and water supply improvements to three steel reservoirs. Uh, this project will correct seismic deficiencies at three welded steel reservoirs to ensure there is sufficient water available in the tanks for firefighting and drinking water purposes. Uh, there are structural deficiencies um, within these in different, in different forms, uh, and we feel that this is, again, an appropriate and reasonable ask to have, uh, albeit we are uh, continuing to work on to, on identifying the most appropriate approach to completing this task, um, we think hazard mitigation will help us finance and make that one come to fruition quicker. Uh, project 158 is a traffic signal retrofit, uh, including battery backups. Uh, this project will install battery backups at traffic signals throughout the city to help facilitate evacuation efforts. Um, it will also allow traffic flow to continue operating during the course of a power outage. Uh, the battery backups can typically last between four and six hours. They are also somewhat portable. I say somewhat, they are bulky. They're a little challenging to disconnect. You pick them up, you move them to another one. If there's a more critical intersection, section that you want to keep running for a longer period of time. Um, during the event in October, we did have a number of signals that went dark, made it more challenging for public safety officials to help folks evacuate out of those communities. Uh, this would help us uh, not deploy resources at locations where we don't have to. Uh, and so it would help us get resources where they're most desperately needed. Uh, Project 249 is the water treatment plant uh, facility flood flooding mitigation. Um, this project uh, will create um, a uh a flood wall, uh, about a 6,500 lineal foot berm wall and gates around the facility at the regional treatment plant. It's in an effort to uh, save and sustain operations there and keep from having significant damage to critical facilities and infrastructure. So, Director, really fast, that one sticks out like a sore thumb to me, not just because of the total cost, but every other project that's on this list, the local share is either 25% or I think one is 12.5%. This one's local share is 60% of the total cost. 
Can you talk a little bit about how this project was selected? So I'm gonna, I'll talk about the uh, the local match component while, while my counterparts from water come down. Um, the hazard mitigation program has a maximum, a maximum of $5 million of granted funds. And so the local match for this particular project would be higher simply because the local mat or the, the amount provided to the local agency is capped. This project addresses a um, very long-standing vulnerability we have at the Laguna Treatment Plant. We do have a history of floods. We've put in over the last few years a temporary, very small wall to protect the most essential equipment. This grant, this project is already in the CIP, so this grant would just be offsetting the maximum amount, which is $5 million, and provide, obviously, a, a significant benefit and allow the project to move forward in a more financial financially advantageous way. Project 116 is the, oh, my apologies. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, the nerves keeps me moving. Um, so Project 116 is a chipper program. Uh, this program is intended to provide education as well as physical work to help property owners manage their properties better uh, in the in the wildland urban urban interface um, in an effort to try to reduce uh, fuel loadings uh, in and around those areas. Uh, the wildfire early detection and notification options. Um, this uh, is a project that I'm gonna ask the chief to come down and talk about uh, in more detail uh, once I finish this uh, portion of the presentation um, so that he can give you a little more information about what notifications mean. Uh, in this particular case, I have it listed as a project 287. Project 287 is actually um, something very specific relating to sirens uh, and we are going to not not submit that uh, for the September 4th uh, and Tony will go into more detail about how we want to coordinate and work with the county in an effort to come up with a comprehensive plan on that. So before before we go too farther, uh, too much further, that conversation will be brought forward in a second, but I want to remind council that there are additional opportunities. There's an October time period and then there will be an additional opportunity that has not been scheduled yet because there is an additional fires ongoing and a presidential disaster. So there are multiple opportunities for us to be continuing through this process to submit a hazard mitigation grants. Unfortunately, these things do trail the disaster. Uh, FEMA is, is, we're, is advocating for a more proactive approach um, that would would have investments come in, in in advance of disasters instead of response to disasters because they do also understand the struggle and the and the pressures this puts on local communities to just be responding to these situations. But I don't want to make it seem like there are not going to be additional opportunities to direct um, requests to our mitigation experts, there will be, there's one in October and then there'll be one after that in response to the current fires. So what we've done, uh what we've done instead of discussing sirens at this specific uh, project is we've we've been working with the county on a camera program, and what you see on here and what you read in the description of the staff report specifically relates to the coordination efforts that the city fire department is having with various entities at the county in an effort to deploy cameras uh, as an early detection system. And so the local match that you see there would be our share of the local match. Uh, that's why it looks again different from some of the others as far as not being 25%, it's actually half of that 25%. Uh, and that would be our share of, of participating in their application that is ready to go. Uh, and then Tony will come down and talk more about um, the other components of that. Uh, the last uh, item that we have here is uh, Project 290, which is the Storm Drain Master Plan. Uh, one of the things that we don't have in this community is a comprehensive evaluation of our storm 
storm drain system. We don't know where the weaknesses are. We do know from past history that flooding does occur. It does exist in town, uh, but we don't have a clean, clear way of tracking exactly where those things are. A storm drain master plan will tell us uh, as an infrastructure component where our deficiencies are and how we might need to address those deficiencies moving forward into the future. And so this is a critical component that we have as part of our, our storm drain um, community or our storm drain uh, team and trying to get them to better understand what our infrastructure really looks like. So with that, I'd like Tony to come down and talk about the siren or the interaction with the county. Ms. Combs. But before you go to talk in more detail about any one of them, um, I can't make the numbers add to the number at the bottom for our total approved projects local share. And I just wonder if somebody can double check that. It's, it's possible it has to do with rounding, but I can't get the last three digits. And I haven't done the whole set of numbers. I just was sitting here adding up the numbers and couldn't make them work. So if somebody can check the numbers, I'd appreciate it. It's probably rounding, but to get three digits wrong makes me nervous. So if somebody could have a quick look. Thanks. This one's right. Uh, I will. I will confirm. And I will confirm it. it, 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 it like, I'm really not playing God. The, I was just sitting here adding numbers. It's so it, <laughs> I, I will say there was some. There was a, a very last minute change in this. That was the project 287, um, and and I will. I'm going to apologize up front. There are there are numbers that are incorrect here, and I'm going to describe those in detail. Um, if you look at attachment A, attachment A does have the. Uh, it is, it's basically this table. It should have the actual numbers. I apologize if I didn't get that that uh, total all squared away. Hello. Yeah, hey, Tony Gosner, uh, Fire Chief for the City of Santa Rosa. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the wildfire early detection and notification options. Uh, there's a lot of work that's going on with the county and the surrounding areas uh, regarding emergency alerting as well as options. How are we gonna notify the community uh, aside from phone calls and, and uh, internet options, so to speak. So one of the things that we, we commonly hear is uh, the questions about sirens. <clears throat> and for us, sirens really, we're gonna look at them. We're gonna have a community meeting, uh, a few community meetings, four or five in September. And uh, we're gonna go through a process of what we're looking for in a early detection uh, system. I will tell you right off the bat that sirens, I'm not a big fan of them. They're, they were designed in the, the 40s. You know, they were air raid sirens. So when you're outside, you hear the siren, you get inside. Uh, with today's houses, they're built so tight you'd have to have so many sirens around the city for people to hear them uh, in the middle of the night. <clears throat> it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now. Uh, I will say that um, where sirens do make a huge impact is at a like a tsunami warning where it's a single purpose. You hear the siren go off, you know exactly what to do. You go to high ground. And we just don't have that in our urban areas. So... <clears throat> We have some volunteer departments that still utilize sirens. Uh, they don't go off for the three minutes, they go off for uh, a few cycles and they shut down. So sirens to us are, are a little problematic in public education moving forward. Where we really think we're gonna have great success is with the, the uh, camera system. So the Sonoma County Water Agency is uh, has eight cameras that they're gonna put up. In fact, we have two meetings tomorrow, one's an emergency alert systems, talk about next Excel, SoCo Alert, uh, WIA, and EAS. And then in the afternoon, we have a presentation on the wildfire camera systems. What the wildfire camera systems do, they give us a large view of, of Sonoma County. So when a call comes in, dispatchers, they have, I was up there last Friday for a call in Petaluma. Uh, I went in to go make sure everyone was doing all right, making sure all the resources were moving where they need to move. And they had a big TV up there with two cameras on. 
assuming the two cameras were sh shining towards um, or showing towards Lake County and you could see the two columns, one from the river fire, one from the ranch fire. So that was one camera shining towards Lake County. We had another camera shining towards Southern uh, Sonoma County, but it wasn't angled enough to see the fire in Petaluma. So right now, Cal Fire has St. Helena specifically, the dispatch center has the ability to move those cameras around so we can see, pan the camera to certain areas. And we actually called them that day to see if they can pan that, that camera over. They weren't able to, but we are gonna have access to do that in our dispatch centers um, uh, shortly. And we're gonna have access to at least eight cameras just for Sonoma County. In addition, working with PG&E and other uh, players, there's gonna be multiple cameras placed throughout the, uh, the county that we'll have access to and we'll be able to steer the cameras where we need to. So when a call comes in for a wildland fire, we know the area, we can take a look at the TV. There's the, okay, I, I see smoke, I don't see smoke, it's growing fast, it's moving fast, you know. It'll give us some opportunity to, to know what's going on and that will allow us to alert those citizens in that area at a much faster rate and with the situational awareness that we just did not have back in October. So we really feel that's where the value is. That'll work for wintertime storms, summer, uh, and, and anyone can get into it. So you can be at home and log into it and look at the cameras. It's kind of like the Tahoe, the cameras at Tahoe, is it snowing? Let me punch in here, oh yeah, it is snowing. Uh, so it gives the community something to access when they need to. It also gives uh, the dispatchers uh, the ability to look at certain areas of the county when there is a reported fire, and that gives us uh, you know, a lot of times we'll be responding to the fire, we won't see smoke. Dispatchers can tell us, no, we have a column of smoke and this is where it is, or we don't see smoke either, so we can adjust our response uh, accordingly. I'll say last uh, two days ago there was two reported vegetation fires that turned out to be dust. So those are some things that, that we can, right, people are disking their fields and one was a leaf blower, believe it or not, but it was kicking up a lot of dust, enough to where people that live on Fountain Grove were calling it in. It was in the Mark West Springs area. So we had two calls like that in the last few days and that this will give us the ability to be able to look and monitor and say, yes, there is smoke, it is building, or we saw something but it's gone uh, and they'll be able to triangulate and figure out exactly where that is. So that's the way we're heading right now at this point. So uh, Chief, can, if I can just interrupt for a second. Um, you talked about being up there and seeing the screens. Where's up there? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I was at the Redcom Dispatch Center. Okay, so yeah. Redcom is monitoring these cameras now? Redcom has a TV dedicated to these two cameras right now. There's only two up and running. There's gonna be up to eight for Sonoma County uh, through the, the one program, but there's gonna be multiple other cameras that we'll have access to once we get the system up and running. So so w w I wanna make clear of a couple things that are going on right now. What, what staff has been able to identify is the, um, one of the challenges that happened in the fire last, uh, last October was situational awareness. Without situational awareness, it's hard to deploy resources against those resources where you need to have them to for, and in that includes evacuations, fighting fires, and, and would actually be a conversation even in uh, different types of a disaster situations. Um, I have traveled down to see San Diego and see the ability that um, San Diego Gas and Electric is affording um, uh, the county of, of San Diego and being able to support those types of endeavors through a robust camera system. Uh, we are not walking away from the conversation about other types of alerting options, which include sirens, could include conversations about individual radios, supplying people that have landline conversations. We're looking at all of those things. There are challenges with those, those items and there's frankly a coordination effort that has to be associated with the other jurisdictions because sound does not stop at one jurisdictional boundary or another. We're gonna go into some conversations with, through our neighborhood resiliency uh, initiative into um, a variety of communities that work's being planned right now to do several things. First of all, provide a robust education experience around the alerting systems that are available to folks. We will actually staff this to have the ability for people to enroll on the spot. We're pursuing ability, we're pursuing maybe even having um, some baseline uh, 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 
material for people to take back to their homes to make themselves more resilient uh, in their home at that moment. We will also be going through some of these scenarios and trying to better understand what the community is expecting and what they need from us as, as protectors of this community. So we will be listening. We will also be evaluating that with our subject matter experts from Ernst & Young because they have experienced uh, siren systems that quickly degraded. In fact, the capital area of D.C. after 9-11 built up a siren system that is no longer, was never used, is now no longer functional. We need more time to get into those conversations because they do require those interagency coordinating efforts. What we will then do is bring back a program in the next phase in the October period for council to consider for funding. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like that this is just one choice, but the immediate choice and the one that staff can understand the value of and is being worked on as a coordinated effort is in the camera area. But, but the commitment is we, starting in September, we're going to get into a conversation with our community exactly about this issue. So um, that's the plan. Um, more to come on that plan, but this is not, should not be interpreted as walking away from one thing or another. We've got to go through an evaluative process on these things and really understand what these tools are and how they might benefit the community. Yeah, and with that, I'll just add, we're working with the county on that too. The county does have a certain areas that they'd like to use sirens. One of them's Fish Mountain. It's a mountain with brush and trees, one way in, one way out. So a siren might make sense for that community. We may have some of those areas bordering Santa Rosa that we might want to employ. The problem with sirens is when it's really windy, the sound doesn't carry like it does on a nice sunny day, right? So there's a lot of limitations. There's some studies that we're looking at, but we're not discounting like the city manager said. We're going to look at it, everything, but we want to make sure that, that whatever we use is going to be easy to maintain and give us the best situational awareness so we can alert the community as quick as we can. Thank you. Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this, this sounds good. I was one of the big fans of sirens. I think a lot of us were because we were kind of hearing from the community after the fire that this seemed like a no-brainer and what I'm hearing you say makes a lot of sense. The wind sound carrying appropriately through housing. But one of the, the questions I still have that, that I didn't hear get addressed, and if you did, I apologize, and that is that I think one of the appeals to sirens was the concept of, of itself as a technology being resilient, of having redundant power systems that in the event of, of an earthquake, a nearby fire, um, could activate, could still be activated. Um, how would these cameras be uh, resilient, if you will, in the same way that a siren potentially could be? That's one question. Uh, the second question would be is cameras are great, but really it, it depends on the operator to make the call, right? That was one of the problems with our fire is that we knew it was coming, but somebody somewhere decided that uh, we needed to let the situation potentially evolve before taking action. How is this camera system going to be or not be vulnerable to those, those uh, Achilles heels, if you will? Um, well, I'll, I'll speak to the, the last first, and so there's, there's always going to be human, you know, decision making uh, for these systems. What we didn't have in October was a camera system, so what we had was hearsay, we heard some radio traffic on different radio channels, um, but it was never corroborated. I myself went on Fountain Grove and I said, I, I see a little glow way out there. It's a long ways away. And that was at 11.30, 11.45 at night. And we you know it came into town at one o'clock. So there was really, unless you post somebody up there just watching it march at you and everyone's too busy to do that. With the camera systems, it's in the dispatch center. Well, dispatch will be able to, uh, be able to monitor that as well. Any dispatch center can, you know, Sonoma County Sheriff's can do it. Santa Rosa PD can look at it. So if there's anything on the outskirts, they can log right in and and take a look. And we will have access to the controls of those cameras, so we're not calling somebody to do it. We just, it's brand new. So we're just, you know, they're, they're testing it out. There's certain logins and safeties that we have to employ right now. So, um, you know, that is... That's going to give us uh, the best bang for our buck, in my opinion. As far as resiliency, 
with the cameras as well as the sirens. Everything runs on electricity, so if the if we say we PG and E degenerizes the the system, there's got to be some sort of a, a battery backup. It's not going to be forever. Uh, I believe Jason talked about a, a backup that was going to last four to four to six hours for a traffic light. I would assume something similar to these, but again, these are so new, and I apologize, we weren't involved in the, the creation of this. This was, mm -hmm. by the way, we're doing this, come learn, and we're, we're gonna learn together. Tomorrow at two, one o'clock, that's what we're doing as part of a, the larger program. So I will know more of these answers as we move forward, but that's on everyone's mind. That, what happens if the power goes down? What happens if, if the internet goes down? What happens if, right? So there's always the what ifs. So we're trying to uh, take a look at all of those and and we can't solve everything. I can't sit here and guarantee you that it'll always work. Uh, but what I can say is that the the camera systems that are being used in the Tahoe area have been very good and very resilient. Thanks, so one, one follow up question I have, you mentioned that it's gonna go to dispatch. Does that mean that we will have the decision making power to issue an evacuation notice over people in the city of Santa Rosa? Because I know that was also um, a criticism, I think, of the city due to a confusion about whose responsibility it is to notify. Am I making sense? A little bit. Okay, so yeah. I, what, I, what I'm driving at is will, will the county hold the authority to call, make the evacuation calls? We, or will we? We hold the authority for the city of Santa Rosa. Now, if we're super busy, we might ask them to do it. You know, my goal is to make sure that when we do evacuations, it resides in our primary dispatch centers for the city of Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa Police Department. For the larger Sonoma County, is Sonoma County Sheriff's Department. Redcom is called a secondary dispatch. So all those calls we get go through one of either Santa Rosa or um, Sonoma County or Petaluma or Sebastopol PD before they come to the fire side, right? So, but what what we really need to focus on is when when we uh, issue evacuation, it'll go out through our center. We're working with police right now on that, and we have control of that, just like the county will have control of the county. There has to be some linkage. We have to communicate and coordinate because you got two different systems. Doing it. One of the things we had that night, we had SoCo Alert, Nixol. People were confused, and and I get that, but there's got to be coordination. And part of it is the education that we have to pump out to the residents of Santa Rosa and the county. So, so uh, continuing on what the chief was saying, so one of the one of the real challenges in evacuation is uh, the system that's currently utilized, and I saw it once again being deployed in Reading, is a radius system in, in a lot of the state, which means, you know, w one of the real challenges is when you've divided up in a radius system, how people get caught up in a radius system. What San Diego County does, and I'm not saying it's a foolproof system, no system is, is relies on a grid system. But that took many years to develop. I think we can capitalize on the work that they've developed there, but a grid system means you're pointing to grids in a map, which may actually fit more in, into compartments that reflect where your city boundaries are and actually reflect geographical locations. When you lay out a circular radius, people get caught up in that radius that may be on the other side of a mountain, on the other side of, of, of a of a other type of barrier, but they get caught up in these issues. And then that's what sort of degrades the ability to form and, and puts pressure on staff to make evacuation calls that are based upon a radius mentality. So I, I would say that's why this is so much more comp this is an example of where all these things interplay and make these very, very complicated conversations. And the key to this is to move to and inter, as the chief said, I would strike the word some in interoperability. We need an interoperable system that works. Um, we have to work together and we have to make sure that we're all using the same terminology. I was down in uh, the aftermath of um, what had happened in Ventura County and, and Santa Barbara County and those two counties can't agree on, on, on um, uh, evacuation terminology, meaning that if you're sitting on the border of a county there, one side, you're, you're, 
you're getting information from two different sources using two different terminologies. We have to change that. That's the essential thing that gets us into a rational way to deal with these issues, where we're using one terminology, we're using a standard approach, and it takes into consideration. That is not going to appear overnight. That takes years to build. Part of what we're going through right now in this mitigation process is trying to build some of these systems of interoperability so that we can make this a much, much safer place. We have a, head, we have a leg up as it relates to fire. Um, some of the council, the, the recovery and rebuild are going down with two supervisors at the end of the month to actually see this system because this system actually is something I believe that both the city and the county sh and, and the other cities in this county, I can't emphasize that enough, need to participate in and need to get aligned with. I mean, a grid system sounds like it's easy, but it's going to require all the public safety divisions to default to the same management plan. And I'm sure the former chief will tell you that that's going to be its own lift in itself, but that's where we have to go as a community. Ms. Combs. Thank you. Obviously, uh, nobody in this room wants a system that doesn't work. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, I am hopeful that whatever system we select doesn't require opting in. And I wanna make sure that, that we have that in mind. Um, my other concern is um, to make sure that we have a robust public engagement process. And I'm not talking about public education. I'm talking about a public engagement process. Um, it, with the extent of the conversation that we've just had and with some of the opinions that have already been reflected, it has a little bit of a feeling that sort of the experts have already decided and this is what we're going to do. And I appreciate that we have subject matter experts to call on. I certainly support wildfire early detection and situational awareness. I don't have any problem with the camera system. I want our public to feel, particularly now, that they can sleep safely at night and that they will wake up if they need to by an emergency notification. And for me, that's the bottom line. I won't say what the notification has to be, but people need to be able to sleep at night believing that they'll be notified. Um, it, I myself have a lot of personal experience with disasters. Uh, I've been through, what, eight or nine tornadoes, uh, at least two hurricanes, where the roof of the adjacent apartment building was torn off. Mine, for some unusual reason, wasn't, but all the others in my complex were. Um, I lived within 10 miles of Three Mile Island when that nuclear disaster happened. I'm, I'm only listing a few. I, I somehow have had a lot of experience living as a resident in disasters. Um, it was really helpful when Three Mile Island was happening that the fire station had a signal alarm and that I was, I heard this siren that we didn't normally hear and turned the radio on. That, that was helpful for me in informing my evacuation. Um, I'm not requiring a siren, but, that I, but I know that my own phone at home, I have, in addition to good cell phone service, a landline. It doesn't ring. Nixle doesn't serve it. There isn't really a mechanism for Nixle to send my landline a text message. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out what's gonna wake me up because a text message isn't gonna wake me up either. Um, so whatever we do, we need a robust public engagement process and we need to be able to tell our residents that they can sleep at night and they will be woken if they need to be. So that's, that's my only 
That's my bottom line. And I look forward to how we solve that going forward. Thanks. Right. I hear you. I couldn't agree more. I, I will tell you that we use, the Sonoma County used the WEA system on the pallet fire and the fire in Sonoma about a month and a half ago. And they, they choked it down to a small area and they sent out the alert. Um, and afterwards, it's like, all right, who got it? You know, start making some phone calls, make sure people received it. People on AT&T got it, people on Verizon didn't. And it was a function, or I might have that backwards, but one or the other didn't get it. And it was a function of where you drew the circle and what cell towers were in that circle. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex issue that we're trying to parse through. And I will tell you, Nixel, that's part of our, our our problem, there's confusion over Nixel, SoCo Alert, WIA, EAS. Nixel is an informational system that people sign up to get information from largely law enforcement on multiple items. Some departments use it as a community engagement and others just simply give information when it's needed. Sometimes it's hard when what it gives me is that Santa is flying by. Right. <laughs> it's like, well, wait a minute, I'm alerting to this because I'm, yeah. <laughs> it's too close to a fire for that. So while Nixel was used a lot on in October, that's really, uh, and it, it worked for the people around Nixel, we need to make sure people sign up for SoCo Alert, which is opt-in. But also, we are gonna use the, the county has already said, we are gonna use the wireless emergency system and we're gonna use EAS. So EAS is the AMBER system. If you have a... Is that comparable to reverse 911? Yes, SoCo Alert is also comparable to, so if you have a landline, it should work already, but you gotta sign up for your, and that's the for that's your the, cell phone. The opt-in piece concerns me. Right. But let's, I, I, we don't need to solve it right. today. I just wanna make sure I just, we have a robust yep. engagement. I guess well, my point is, is we're gonna use everything. We're not gonna use one or the other. We're using all of it. And, and this may lead to some additional conversations. Uh, the the mayor and I sat in, a, and the chief and I sat in a conversation with the FCC shortly after the event, and we can say that, uh, for, at least from my perspective, and I'm sure the two other gentlemen would concur, that was a less than satisfactory conversation about the FCC's potential role in making sure that this interoperability between private providers is there. But that that's going to be that's going to be a lift that we're going to have to um, make on a national level, and our allies are aware of that conversation, but there, there is going to have to be those types of conversations about interoperability as we go through this process. Mr. Schwedhelm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Chief, for this information. Um, just that interoperability. Um, so the Sonoma Water has purchased the eight cameras. You know, I've seen them and they're great. Have they committed to actually integrating with what we may do if we do them and the county? Yes, they, they have. Everyone, we, we all have to work together. There's just, no, no, right? I get that. And, you said that and it, or is yes. it in writing somewhere? Uh, well, I've heard it aloud. I've not seen it in writing. Thank you. But it is allowed. Okay. And then, so with this program, this is just the city of Santa Rosa, correct? We're competing for, just with this one, uh, Project 287. In conjunction with the county, it's to tie in with the county as so well. So that's my question, is are we competing against them or are we individual? So, so this particular, so what it is, is we're, we're working with them. The, the request that we're asking a council for that specific item is to allocate funds so that we can participate with their application. So it's one application that the county will be submitting. We would be a, we would be a partner with them on that application. And do they have similar dollar amounts that we do? Yes, so what we twenty five percent is the local match, and we would be splitting that that local match with the county and uh, an appropriate number of cameras would be located within an, an area that would benefit the city. That was my actual comment, but we don't know what that appropriate number is. I guess one of the struggles is, and I love doing this collaboration, we're 43 square miles, how many hundreds of square miles is the county responsible for? And a 50-50 split may not seem like, it, it, is that the most equitable way of doing it? Well, I think is, this is an evolving conversation. We're commit, we want to show the commitment to that, but that is our underlying thesis, is that we're going to be doing this in a way that benefits our citizens. That's where our share is coming from. Great, and then the other question I have is about the safety of the 
cameras, just like when we relocated the fire station, we got the temporary one for a buck, but then there's a million bucks to do all the uh, infrastructure. Um, where would these be located? I mean, it sounds funny, they can put them on a tallest tree so you get the best view, which then makes them susceptible to being, if, if the tree burns. Are there additional costs for actually the infrastructure to mount the cameras, or is it included in these dollar figures, or might we have to, might you have to come back to us to fund the actual structure to mount the cameras? We'll bring Neil in, he's the other expert. No pressure, Neil. Hi. So just to back up a little bit, there, there's essentially three phases of cameras. There's the water agency one that's going in now, there's PG&E, and then there's the ones that would come under this project, which essentially by the end of when all the cameras got installed would look at a huge amount of not only the county of Sonoma, but the areas in wildland and other counties that would come in. So if the fire were coming in from somewhere else, it would give us the ability. And within this project, you're looking at infrastructure included for essentially 10 cameras that would be part of this system. What I've been, when I sit with the county advocating for is that our $250,000 would go for cameras in locations like up in Sky Farm, uh, in areas that benefit the city on where they look out on. And yeah, what you're seeing represented there as far as our local match is the cost of the camera. Um, you have to do something called backhaul on data. So in other words, microwave, so it can send the, the pictures to dispatch to see, making sure that there's power and backup power for all of it. So within the price tag you're seeing there, we're joining in on 10 cameras. Probably three to four of those would be locations, and not necessarily within the city, but protecting the city in the areas they look at. Okay, and one of the reasons why I bring this up, um, you all probably remember when the fire was heading towards Mount San Lina and there's some key communication towers, and if the fire reached it, that was gonna create a whole other bunch of problems. So I'm just wondering what you know we can do to ensure that you know, the camera is, is, is safe and secure and is gonna to continue to do what we're paying for it to do. Well, well, there's a lot of unknowns. So, so what I would say is the lesson that we've here heard continually is infrastructure is going to at some point fail. So what you're trying to do is position these the best place to make yourself sexual awareness, take into account what your, what your, your concern are, and I think that's what the teams are, that they're in the safest, most robust location that we can place them. So they might be on another piece of infrastructure that's uh, uh, more protected than if they were up on a tall tree. Those things are taken into consideration. But at the end of the day, the value added proposition is for evacuations and saving life and property. And if we lose a camera, in the endeavor of doing that, I think that that is what we're trying to do is to try to create that most protective. But that is, protecting the asset is part of the conversation as well. And the benefit here is that this is a, with the number of cameras and sort of, they will kind of Venn diagram over an area, you have redundant cameras viewing an area. So if God forbid we lost a camera or a few within the infrastructure of the cameras themselves and that communication, you still are looking out at that area. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Councilman Oliveris. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief, as you continue to work with the county and others on some of the um, I guess solutions we're identifying in the warning, can we uh, check to see where we are with other technology related to satellites. I think uh, maybe five years ago I saw something on PBS uh, talking about satellite technology and identifying wildfires where they'd be able to come down and identify a fire uh, as small, which is not really small, uh, as an acre. And I don't know where that technology is. Uh, and I think at back then they were thinking of maybe uh, a satellite would cover the entire western states. Uh, so I don't, I don't know where that is, but it sounds like something, I don't know how it has evolved since then and, and whether anything's happening. So, so again, we have not, um, uh, the experience I've had and the experience that some of the team is gonna have is the scientific research that's taking place in San Diego. I, I won't necessarily say it's fully satellite driven, but they're doing things like monitoring the amount of moisture in the soil and in the air in, in particular locations that feeds into the meteorological team. And it is a meteorological team that is working for San Diego Gas and Electric. They started this again in their response to the 
seven. They're using the latest science. That's part of the reason uh, I've asked that that group to provide that uh, entree for for the recovery and um, rebuild ad hoc um, the, to look at that particular infrastructure. But we are trying to take the latest science into consideration. Thank you. Because my understanding is that was specific to fires and to be able to identify wildland fires. So I don't know where that technology is today. Yeah, I know during our fire we we ended up having a drone fly over our fire, but it took, you know, four or five days to get that up and running, right? So the thought is, how do we get this up way before, you know, so we can use it to our advantage? And uh, so th that technology is evolving and it's coming faster than ever. Uh, but I will tell you, the Board of Supervisors meeting today, they're talking about technology and it seems like every two to three years, there's something different that overtakes what you already have. And infrastructure is very expensive to turnover constantly. So we're trying to make sure that we have a system that, that makes sense for a long time. At least we can build into that satellite type type stuff. Other questions? Um, is there a time limit for spending these uh, mitigation funds? Should we receive them? Do they have to be spent in a certain amount of time? Three, yes. Three years. Okay. And you know, we, we talk about a lot of federal programs. We've got FEMA, we've got HUD, we've got CBDG. How does, how does this mitigation money differ from from the CBDG mitigation money? So that's a good question. Um, right now there is a mitigation pool that exists within uh, CDVDR that the federal government, it's new to the federal government. I think it was actually created in response to some of the collapsed infrastructure in Puerto Rico um, that they're still piecing their way through. What I can tell council is that um, now that we know a little bit more about the DR money, um, some of the match that you you may be looking to, to do later on may actually be applicable through DR funds because the DR funds are not just about um, uh, uh, a um, unmet need as it relates to housing. They're about protecting the housing so you don't have this kind of recurring event in the future. So there's actually clear language in the in the in the register that was published today that said you must evaluate you must improve your infrastructure to meet the needs and be make protective measures um, that will address and mitigate future similar disasters. So there is an opportunity for us to utilize some of that other funding to help meet the match needs as it relates to some of these projects as we move forward. We'll be bringing that conversation forward as we go through the entire unmet need conversation in the next three months. Thank you. Yeah, the hazard mitigation grant program is a competitive process. Uh, it, it's it's a statewide competitive process uh, where the DR funds the DR funds will be delegated to specific um, regions, uh, and uh, so there there is a difference in how the funds get delegated to different organizations. So from the from the hazard mitigation standpoint, each of these projects will go on a statewide, similar to other grant proposals that we might sit out there, uh, and they will be selected based on merit. Um, we think that uh, by submitting the grants that we've proposed at both the July 1st and the September 4th, we think we've got some great projects. We think they'll be very competitive, uh, but it is competitive. And so the the ultimate, but there's no there, there's no guarantee that will be that will be selected. So as we're asking, as we get into the recommendation on this, um, we're recommending that the council authorize the submittal of the grants uh, and that they um, set aside general funds to be able to pay for the local match should all six of those grants be approved. I don't know how likely that is. We obviously, from staff standpoint, would hope that they would be. I think it would provide the highest level of protection for the community. Um, it does come at a, at a cost. Uh, the number that, that um, you see on the screen, as unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is inaccurate based on the last minute change relating to the early notification program. And so the total uh, applications being requested would amount to uh, 5,731 million, 
$5,731,462 in federal funds with a local match of $1,182,866. So, um, so the uh, total application request from FEMA would be five million seven hundred thirty one thousand four hundred and sixty two. The local match, meaning the request for general fund dollars would be one million one hundred and eighty two thousand eight hundred and sixty six. Uh, so that would be what we'd be, we're asking council to approve as we move forward with these grant applications. Uh, and then as obligations come forward, we would be asked to move, to uh, incorporate those funds into the agreement with FEMA and Cal OES. And that one, one million, one hundred and eighty two thousand would, would be from the reserves at this point? At this point, that would be from the reserves, correct. So um, I was asked by the CFO to, if asked that question, to remind you that we do have $6.6 .6 million in reserves, and that would reduce the reserves to approximately $5.4, $5.5 million. And with that, um, I know we've spent a bit of time talking about Tony's project. If you have questions about any of the other projects that are on there in more detail, um, staff is here if I can't answer the question to provide them higher level of detail. Can we also hear briefly about the local match that's needed for the, the um, water enterprise fund? We can, I wasn't prepared to really describe that, but we can absolutely. Uh, so if you look at the table um, that was provided, so from a local match standpoint, uh, the a majority of the local match that's associated on the table comes from the Water Enterprise Fund. It's it's approximately uh, nine million dollars. So the the matching funds for Project 167, which is the backup generator, is 1.845 million um, for one Project 196, which is the seismic and water supply improvements, uh, is 2.1 million dollars, and the water treatment facility flood mitigation is three point roughly 7.4 million dollars. Um, that last one would come from the sub-regional capital fund. Uh, the uh, project 196 would be from the water capital fund, and then project 167 would be uh, a f split between the water and water enterprise fund. And is that from um, water enterprise fund reserves? How does that? I'm gonna have to ask either Ben or Joe to come down and answer that question. Excuse me, just one moment. I think I have a list. I just didn't have it broken out. So the funds are broken up into several areas. They include, as as uh, Director Nutt mentioned, the water and wastewater enterprise funds, the capital fund, and the sub-regional capital fund. And some of these have already been allocated through the, the capital improvement program, so they would offset the, the grant program, but I do not believe those come from water reserves. It's a mix. 
it, and that that is because there the projects consist of you know the backup generators will be at both water facilities and at wastewater facilities and then the flood wall is at the treatment plant so you have some regional funds that will be added or that will come from there okay the, the flood wall has been in the capital improvement plan for a while at this point that's correct any other questions Ms. Combs Thank you. While you're there, can you just clarify for me why 290 is general fund and not water related? I appreciate that storm drains. Yeah, so that's so <laughs> our, our storm drain program actually is a general funded program. Even though it resides in the Santa Rosa Water Department, it does receive general funds um, because it's generalized infrastructure. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have a 218 oriented um, funding source that supports its entire operation. And Could so, uh, there so, so there is some there is some um, question about that. We're investigating that um, right now, but at this time uh, that. That is where it, it sits, but we staff is actually um, both both in the city manager's office, the water utility, and in the legal department investigating some recent um, decisions and 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 seeing where that will ultimately reside. But that's still an open question, and so that's why it's in a general fund. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, it does. Thank you. Have a couple of cards here, Peter Cherneff. So it's really uh, astounding to me that so much effort will be put into a situation where you're trying to control the actions of Creator Almighty. You're trying to abate the actions of Creator Almighty. And believe me, I am well aware that of my own responsibility as everything is connected. You talk about cameras, cameras, cameras. Maybe we should uh, examine a picture of ourselves. Some say this is the new normal. Uh, I think that's insane. The blinded public are responsible for the conditions of our illusionary reality, the spirituality, uh, to, to spiritually detect true cause and effect, um, the cause being the continuing of oil in the slaughterhouse, and you've all been, we've all been witnessing the effect. It's been said long ago, and I know you heard this, that those who seek to save their lives shall lose them. And things, and because the public, uh, the people uh, want to maintain the slaughterhouse and oil industry, more and more things get more and more hazardous for firefighters and law enforcement. And FEMA is the icing on the cake of this banker's coup, federal domination. How's that sit with the U.S. Constitution? No system will work when an almighty remains denied. Serving two masters maintains all these disasters. And man's efforts while denying creator be fruitless. How many firefighters need perish? How many firefighters have watched tens of thousands of homes and buildings burn and more or less all they could do is watch? We've been given all the opportunities in this beautiful place to change everything for the better, and yet we choose not to. We're, we're trying to correct actions of Almighty, and yet even here with this huge project in Santa Rosa where uh, they say only 30% of the labor will come from uh, local workers, that's unacceptable. You know, they're usurping our common sense loyalty and hopes. It seems more and more evident to all that out-of-state and out-of-country influences are really ruling, ruling our roost. And again, serving usurious bankers in the bar who have stolen their power from our liberty. It's time for labor to arise with no more compromise and shut things down with the freedom strike. For the iron rod of God has now passed through California three times via incineration, otherwise known as the Hopi prophecy purification. Bob Hansen. Good afternoon, everybody. Since I retired, 
I volunteer a 30-day fire lookout position in Idaho. A trained observer sitting on top of a mountain with a battery-powered communication system and a good fire finder is better than any camera. I have a range in Idaho of 50 miles. I've reported fires up to 50 miles. 360 degree view. Why can't we develop a system of volunteer fire lookouts on top of our mountains? It works in Idaho, it works fine. They have no problem staffing it with volunteer ex-firemen, ex-National Forest. Within one minute of me reporting a smoke, I am in touch with IDL, Idaho Department of Lands, federal fire, state fire, and local fire within one minute. A volunteer fire lookout system, to me, is the answer to this. Not $10 million on cameras, volunteer trained lookouts on top of our mountains. Let's explore that option. I know we're gonna have no problem staffing it with qualified people. I'll be one of them. This year, I couldn't go up in July because our fire lookout was trashed over the winter. I'm scheduled to go up next fall and rebuild it. But this is a system that works. Nominal taxpayer dollars. Let's explore that. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the cards I have. Um, Mr. Tibbetts, you have this item. I move item 14-1 of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, motion to approve the submittal of six 404 hazard mitigation grant program project applications requesting $5,404,847 in federal funds and appropriate general funds totaling 1,464,116 as the local match and wait for the reading of the text. Excuse me, Mayor, if I could correct those numbers just yeah. briefly. Uh, the total program number is 5,731,462, and the n amount of general fund it totals 1,182,866. And I apologize again for that. 5,731,462. 5 and the local match being 1,182,866. Second. Thank you. Your votes. And that passes with six eyes. Thank you very much. Ms. Gomez, do you have cards for Item 13. Moving back to item 13, public comment on items not on the agenda. We'll start with Alima Silverman, followed by Debbie Griffin. Hello, uh, I'm Alima Silverman. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and other council members. I'm an architect here in Santa Rosa. Uh, I'm a member of the Rebuild Green Coalition, which is a coalition of architects, engineers, and others that are helping people rebuild from the fires. I'm also helping people within Santa Rosa uh, build ADUs, accessory dwelling units. And that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. 
or this afternoon. Um, the primary issue, it has to do with water and sewer connections. If someone wants to build an ADU in their backyard, they are required by the city of Santa Rosa to uh, put in a separate water and sewer connection. No other city in Sonoma County requires that, but the city of Santa Rosa does. So, um, I have spoken with uh, David Gurren uh, back in early July, but I haven't heard back from him yet. But yesterday, I had the best information from a city staff member who said that the regional CPUC, not the state, but the regional CPUC, uh, made the water and sewer connection fees a requirement uh, based on a request from the city of Santa Rosa Water Department. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's back on you. So um, I just think that requirement needs to go away in order for people to actually build ADUs within the city. So housing is all, you know, uh, what we're all about here right now. So um, I'm here to offer assistance to either people in the city or elsewhere uh, to help build ADUs within the city uh, so that we can have more housing. So that's my agenda. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Debbie Griffin, followed by Ann Seeley. Is Debbie Griffin here? Ann, you're up. And Ann will be followed by Peter Cherniff. Mayor Corsi and council members, I sent you an email last night and thank you, Mayor Corsi, for responding to my questions and comments. I have to say before I continue that I'm delighted to hear all the discussion about sirens in today so far in your council meeting. I'm speaking for concerned citizens for Santa Rosa and saying I want to go on record for strongly recommending that the city and county invest and implement a system of sirens placed in each neighborhood to alert people of a major danger, whether it be fire or earthquake. This seems to me eminently sensible as the sound would reach everyone's ears, whether inside or out, and would lead people to investigate what's happening further than on, by media or phone or by knocking on neighbors' doors. The many alternatives that I've heard about in the newspaper and online that are being discussed depend on electronics, on elect cell phone alerts specifically, which I think are an unreliable way of reaching everyone. I have my cell phone tucked away in my purse in another room while I'm sleeping. I wouldn't be alerted to any danger. The sirens of which I speak are the sort used to alert cities of incoming air raids. That sort of system served the population 50 years ago and is a much simpler yet comprehensive system than others being proposed. I hope to hear that there's some progress in creating this system. This might fit into the FEMA grants. Thank you. And I'm glad to hear that you're working with the county on this. Thank you. Peter Cherniff, followed by Bob Hansen. I think that guy, uh, Tony uh, Gallardi, I'm not sure if I spelled his name right, he's, he's got one of the best jobs around, especially here in Sonoma County. And uh, our new Miss Sonoma County uh, definitely spoke and responded with a sincere depth and, and uh, and heart. 
It was impressive. So, the Guinness World Book of Records, it's time to break some records. Um, I'm looking at a, a yoga karmic exercise of 40 days and 40 nights. I'm looking at drum circles. We got some of the best drummers in the world right here in these counties, uh, Onye and Mickey Hart and at least two or three others. How much fun would that be? You're all invited to the party, by the way. And uh, after the 40-day uh, exercise where, you know, we've not spent any money anywhere, we decide uh, perhaps uh, to, to pay only 25% of what we were paying before for mortgages and rents. And all utilities will be just a flat $25, if that. Well, having entertained that idea, that, that means about 340,000 city, county, and work, state workers can now go to a 20-hour uh, week and have more than before, which just opened up 340,000 new jobs. Not bad. So then, then of course we start some garden programs and the, and the labor uh, and construction guys can build a 10,000 football field size greenhouses and so on and so on. But what about law enforcement? Well, we got 90,000 law enforcement in California. Maybe they can go to a 20 hour work week and still make more than before. Less stress, and you can hire up some uh, some veterans that uh, could use some camaraderie and work. And at the same time, you know, in California, we got 320,000 bar lawyers and ever increasing who portray as professional intellectuals of a treasonously contrived industry of uncountable rules with thousands more each year because the more lawyers need more rules so they got more jobs. Well, as the U.S. Constitution would be uh, ruling the nation first time ever out of this, after this 40-day exercise, 95% of the bar attorneys will have no work. But since we've had electric cars and since 1904 and we'll bring back the horses and carriages, it'd be nice to uh, uh, offer these people new jobs because we'll, we'll definitely need street cleaners at this time. Anyways, have a beautiful evening. Bob Hansen followed by Victor Pewterbaugh. Last city council meeting, Jack Tibbetts gave us an excellent presentation on the upcoming bond issue. I could tell by his presentation the amount of work he put into it. But 30% of the residential housing built by a trained construction industry, 30%, 20% goes to Apprentices, 10% to journeymen, that's unacceptable. Our residential housing in the city of Santa Rosa should be 100% local contractors, skilled, trained construction. A year ago, I filed a complaint with the California Board of Contractors. Construction crew came in, $2 million renovation project on public housing. As a retired 35 year carpenter, I was embarrassed on the quality of construction being performed by this construction crew. This was a construction crew the contractor hired off the street corners, bought them a set of nail bags and a t-shirt, called them, and build them as carpenters, plumbers, electricians. They didn't build the code. They didn't use materials that met California code specs. When the foreman left the job, construction stopped. Centuries were posted on the two access points. When he returned, construction resumed. I'm gonna vote no on this bond issue, and I'm gonna tell you why. First and foremost, we just squeaked through a th five year drought, barely. What's projected for our state is a 30 year drought starting in eight years. 
Our aquifers are down 100, 120 feet. It takes eight years of normal rainfall to regenerate. We'll be back to normal when this 30 year drought is starting. We can't guarantee a water supply for this construction agenda. Second, the $6 billion bond is gonna turn into 12.2 billion on maturity. This agenda, this bond issue does not benefit the, the registered voters of our city. Thank you, Mr. It will Hansen. negatively impact the quality of life for Thank the Thank you, citizens. Mr. Hansen. Thank you. Victor Pewterbaugh, followed by Kathleen Winston. Is Victor here? Kathleen? Okay. I'm begging you not to listen to him because I'm one of the people that live, that I'm one of the homeless people that I live in my car over on Apollo Way. And we are circled around Apollo Way and Challenger Drive, homeless people living in RVs, trucks, and vehicles because there is not enough affordable housing for us. We do not have enough money to rent at these outrageously high rents that have gone up. Uh, and um, we desperately need affordable housing. We've been in a 30-year drought. I don't know what he's talking about, that it's going to start in eight years. We've been in a 30-year drought for the past three decades already. But we definitely need that housing. What are we supposed to do? We have to hide like rats now because there's no place for us to go. We need home. We need a place to be home again. I just witnessed an older man get his car, his truck towed away yesterday and it made me so uh, sad because that man, that's all his possessions and his home, and they just came and towed it away. Uh, I live in my car. I'm 68 years old. I worked. I paid $300 a month taxes out of my paycheck, which was the highest rate of pay I made was $7.60 an hour. That's why people, elderly and disabled people on Social Security are not finding places to live now because we desperately need affordable housing. Our culture, our society, our communities did not pay us enough money so that we could live on our Social Security. And now we desperately need affordable housing. Please, get some bill. Because if they don't build it, there's a whole nother generation coming up that's going to be needing that affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank you, Ms. Winston. Gabriel Sendo. Thank you, council members, for uh, being here today. Um, the topic that she was actually just discussing, I'm speaking on the other side of. I am an employee of the North Point um, Business Park, and I have to say that over the last couple of months, the growing um, homeless encampments have become a problem. Uh, not only have there been increasing numbers of individuals joining the community there, but problems have started. You know, use of drugs and sale of drugs has become rampant. Um, Break-ins to vehicles and property has become pretty common. I had one of my friends whose vehicle was broken into and then the next day she also found someone sleeping in it when she came out after work. Uh, in addition to that, you know, razor blades and human waste have been found all over the park. You know, 
they dump it into the field, they dump it into the wastewater management and some of the sewer drains nearby. And you know, on top of that, there's diseases. Um, I've worked in a dog-friendly environment for a number of years now, and we've never had any issues with disease until in the last week, two of our dogs got parvo, and they they were separated from each other and had never had any you know interaction with each other except for walking around on the streets. On top of that, the citizens in the area, you know, they need housing. They need somewhere to go. They've been kicked out of the, the paths and the walkways and the, the various parks in the area, and this is the last venture. And unfortunately, there's not really anywhere else for them to go unless you open up some of the publicly owned areas within Santa Rosa. I know that there's plenty of land that we could send them to. I mean, there's a, an article in the Press Democrat right now that's discussing, you know, a, an encampment that they'd set up, and there's a couple of videos on YouTube discussing the same kind of thing and it worked for a little while but there were either too many people or not enough well positioned and well thought out management to handle it so everyone just scattered and what ends up happening is you end up with these communities that start off with great intentions you know we've had a few uh, individuals in RVs in that area for years and they've never caused any problems but once you stick, start getting large populations you know unfortunately um, bad apples start to show up and they poison the, the well water, as it were. It's caused issues to the point where we've had to hire private security across the entire park to prevent people from being accosted at night. One of my friends was threatened with a knife when he was leaving for his vehicle in the afternoon, not even in the evening, in broad daylight. You know, there's pools of human waste and people sleeping out in the lawns with piles of trash and bikes everywhere. It's a problem and it needs to be dealt with. Find some solution for these people. Find find some affordable housing. Find somewhere that they can go. Get them some help. Get us some help. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Sendo. That's all the cards I have. There's a written communication, the quarterly boards, commissions, and committees attendance report. And with that, we are adjourned.